White Line Fever. Welcome to White Line Fever Live. And you know what the people on YouTube do? They point to the bottom of the screen and they say like and subscribe and um, let and get turn on alerts so you know what's coming up next. And if you're listening on the podcast, welcome back. And a fantastic guest we've got. He doesn't know, but I've been trying to uh, get him uh, on one platform or another for a few years now. From Electric Boys, Connie Bloom. Connie, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. You're coming to us from what home in Stockholm? Where are you? Stockholm, yeah. Right, and we, we're talking about the new album Grand Explosivos, which is out uh, next month. And um, I explained to you before we started, we're going to sort of cut this interview into three for the people listening. And for the for the first section, I really want to talk about the first single. I've got a feeling, uh, which was um, I think the catchiest song. Uh, released this year by anyone anywhere so can you tell us a little bit about the inspiration where 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 you were when the bolt from the blue came and you, and you came up with that incredibly anthemic song uh i don't remember actually <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you expect you expect that you would remember all that stuff but but i actually don't um I do remember a lot of songs how they how they came up came up, but um, I don't know. It, it was um, let me see. I'm looking at the cover here. Um, it was a really, as you said, uh, I think the riff. No, the melody came first in this case. I, I came came up with that uh, vocal, the chorus, and that's what mm. led turned it into a song eventually, and the riff came later. But sometimes, um, especially in the early days yeah. with Electric Boys, most of the songs started with a riff and then added lyrics afterwards. And, and do, you, do you get the feeling that I've, I've got something special there? Because my follow-up question was, was going to be that, you know, at the end of the 80s and the early 90s, if you came up with a hit single, there were people at the record company fawning over you. Uh, you know, it was, it was on the radio. Uh, whereas now the yeah you know, things have changed so much, and obviously uh, tumbling dominoes off, off the last album as well is a is a is a similar example where you have to be confident in your own ability uh, to write a great song. You don't have people around you telling you how well you've done these days. So how do you how do you how how do you keep that internal kind of um, um, standard? Uh, to, to do you still know when you've done something that's 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 above average? I'd say I do, uh, and one of the one of the uh, sort of the main ingredients, or how should I say, it, put it, um, well, usually the songs that end up being songs that people are singing along uh, to when we play live is the songs that sort of write themselves. Mm. Uh, and just like with this one, I, I, as I said, I can hardly remember writing it, but it, it I, I know I came up with a with a chorus. Um, and yes, I thought when I when when that song was demoed, I we all felt that it was a bit special, absolutely. Mm. So we've been doing that live now, which is which is fun because people seem to. They they jump up and down and get into it, so it's it's all good. And the the last record had a little bit of the pandemic in the in the in the in the obviously um, the song I already mentioned, uh, Tumble and Dominoes, <coughs> is kind of yeah. about the pandemic and about. Um, so, did you deliberately want to leave that behind this time? Do you want a party record, or or do the songs just take care of themselves? Yeah, we did. I mean, it's not. Well, I guess eventually we at some point said that let's just make a party record then. But but it just it just naturally went that way because we we were all really tired of we just wanted to leave the whole pandemic behind us basically. Mm. So that's what started happening with the new songs and with the new lyrics and it it ended up going in that direction and and after, you know, after making a lot of demos and stuff and listening back to them, it just felt like, okay, it seems like we're making a party record. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And and like, did, I, I'm wondering because you did a, a, um, a solo record during that pandemic period, which was extremely different. And, and 
with your songwriting, is this is this the center of your personal taste in music, the Electric Boys um, uh, oeuvre, if you like, to use a wanky word, um, or is it just an aspect of your your taste in music? So so is this like, well, there are certain parameters to write, um, um, you know, this sort of, uh, for want of a better word, the funk metal thing, and that's that's what I have to do with Electric Boys, but it's not the only thing I do. Or is this like your favourite type of music? And if you had to write, 10 songs, they'd be Electric Boys songs. You know what I mean? Like, what's, what's your preference, your taste? Um, I can't, I, I couldn't say that really. I mean, first of all, Electric Boys, I always, um, we used to joke and say, call us Eclectic Boys at some point. But I mean, it's like, it was always a, um, a, a matter of mixing a lot of different styles really which event eventually ended up sounding like us but there was a lot of inspiration sources from different different kinds of music and it's the same thing with the with the solo stuff i've done and but i'm i'm really bad at sitting down and like saying that okay i'm gonna write a song or we and it's gonna sound like this so that it's usually the way it usually goes is that nothing happens for for months and then all of a sudden it's like one song comes up and then all of a sudden there's an album written and then there's a gap for many months again when i'm thinking I've, i'll never be able to write again because i don't know how to, how to do it so it's all about, about even after all these years you still have that you don't have that thing in the back of your mind where your confidence going to come eventually because it's come before you know what i mean you know you you know it's going to come yeah, eventually. it used to be more scary in, in the early days now i don't worry that much about it it's more like okay I'll, I'll just do some painting in between or something else and and wait for it to happen but but those i guess that all those periods when when there's no songs writ being written is is like that i guess that's when one is like collecting inspiration for what's what's to come i guess so um i i am kind of a, a bit of a lyrics person and and I, um and and I, domestic blitz um the, the 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 use of the word domestic in that in in that song like what's the i listened to the song a few times over i'm still trying to understand what, what you mean by that in the course you know it's it comes from obviously it's a word playing with words so domestic bliss is what people normally say mm. but domestic blitz mm. to me or to us in this case is like when it's the opposite it's like when when your wife is screaming at you and the kids are screaming and the boss is screaming and you just want to get out of the house basically <laughs> <laughs> and 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 that's actually a, a, a me it's a segue into talking about sweden as domestic market um for you um, I was just in Sweden recently at, at a 50th and I saw a, a massive poster. Uh, you know, you were playing a festival. Um, has Sweden al always been a strong market for you or did the grunge thing hurt you in, in Sweden as well? Um, you know, did, was there a point there where, because uh, the band did break up for uh, quite a while, was that because you weren't commercially viable anymore in, in Sweden or do you think you could have kept going domestically? Well, what's, what, what's the story there? The thing is, you're not the first person saying this. Uh, actually, it's what I get this a lot. But uh, we weren't even thinking about that. That grunge would be something negative. We, as a matter of fact, we actually liked liked when those bands came along because we weren't too keen on the sort of the spandex type sound if you, live, if you see what i mean so uh, we actually felt that we liked that stuff and to me it's not like um i mean that that goes back to listening to to some old music 60s 70s bands and stuff like we've always done as well so we i don't think any one of us ever considered grunge being a, an enemy in some some way but what happened was that we did, we changed two members and then we did the album. And then when they, when we released the album, there wasn't 
the, the record company didn't put in any money into the promotion. And and there was a lot of things that one thing led to another, but but I just felt like uh, I wouldn't be able to write another good album at that point. So so we split the band uh, up in nine. I guess I was ninety four. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, so... And then then I went on to do some solo stuff and play with Ginger from the Wild Hearts and uh, did a solo album, and then eventually. Me and the bass player started playing with Hanoi Rocks 2005 until 2009, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so the the band getting back together wasn't because you thought there, the, the, the environment had changed. It was just because something you wanted to do, yeah? Yeah, for every, it's always been from our own point of view. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's a couple of other things on the on the this record I wanted to ask you about. Karma's going to get you sounds like it's based on something, a story of some sort, just listening to it. Um, is there anything you can share? And also I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. By a Minute, that's another one that seems to be based on an anecdote or an experience. Can, can you share anything on those two songs? Well, I don't, first of all, I don't want to go into it too too much because i think it takes away a bit of the mystery about the songs um as a matter of fact i remember mick jagger saying at some point that one shouldn't sing things pronounce things too too well because it takes away the mystique or whatever if you see what i mean it's like when if you don't hear exactly what it is, then you start making up your own lyrics, and and that's that lyrics usually better, and and dirtier or whatever than the real lyrics. <laughs> I yeah, found yeah. that with a lot of old Aerosmith stuff, I couldn't hear, them and I made up my own lyrics, and then it was like almost a disappointment because my lyrics were. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, no, but I mean, um, Mister by a minute, yes. Um, self, what's the word in English when you've experienced it yourself? Um, karma's gonna get you is um, that was a riff that came from um, from Joel the drummer, and uh, that's more like um, I mean, sometimes when you write lyrics, I, or a lot of times, I would say there's a this there's, there's a mixture of things that you might have. You, you take inspiration from your own experience and you take from other people's experience or what you've read or and some of the stuff you make up, some of the stuff you sing because it sounds great when you sing it. So there's a lot of, uh, and, and, and some, sometimes one song could be all totally like a, your own experience, but, but a lot of songs can be all those elements in the same song. It's a it's yeah, a yeah. lyric for a song, and and sometimes it doesn't need to be much more than uh, you know like Abba or um, or Beatles, whatever. I mean, some of the songs was pretty nonsense, but but it was great <laughs> nonsense. You, you understand? Do you have to. I was going to say, I do. I do. I was going to ask you this in the third part of the interview, but do you? What happens when your lifestyle changes? So the inspiration. For, for for some of the songs changes. So uh, in not in the late eighties, I'd imagine you were living quite a bohemian lifestyle. You're traveling a lot. You're in Los Angeles, you're all around the place. Maybe your life isn't like that now. I don't know. But does that impact on the songwriting process? Do you need to almost do you, do you need to make sure you still have certain stimuli, or do you need to pretend more, or do you you know what I mean? Like like how does how does your change changing lifestyle impact on the songwriting process because hey you just you want to do a party record and Funko Metal part a carpet ride was a party record too so how do you you know but life doesn't stand still so how do you kind of deal with that you know um uh, <laughs> I don't know really I mean uh, you have to keep partying in order to keep writing party music exactly. you know what I mean <laughs> you do exactly. yeah exactly no, but I mean, my life is, I guess it's like with, I don't know if it's most people's lives, but I mean, this, you have some serious stuff going on in life. You you have the party and you travel 
you read things i don't know you know I mean there's um, there's a lot of things in life to be inspired by to write songs and there's like a on upside down there was a song called uh, the dudes and the dancers um at the bass player came up with the bass line and the main idea chorus too i think uh, and that we just told a story from from the sunset strip days so that was like a, more like a storytelling thing so even if even if i wasn't there at that time i still i can still tell the story from when i was there so to speak so, yeah and uh, i don't know a lot of times it's just um, there's something that sparks something off like there's a song called um, better safe than sober for yes. instance, that, that was a wordplay, better safe than sorry, obviously, but, and that, I came up with that line, and that's what, that was the start of that song, and, and it became a song after a while, but, <clears throat> but it's, um, I don't know, you just come up with some idea, and then you build, build, take it from there, and build on that. Um, now. I, to do a bit of research for this interview, Connie, I, I actually went to a, a site called um, Rocks Back Pages. I read an interview that Paul Elliott from Kerrang! did with you guys in 1990 in a hotel bar in Sunset on Sunset Boulevard. And at the end, he predicted you would be millionaires. You'd all be millionaires. You, you know, his, uh, and I just wonder how you kind of look back on that period. And as he listed all the other bands that were around at the time who, you know, who were deemed to be similar, like uh, Lock Up, Dan Reed Network, Stevie Salas, Color Code. Stevie Salas has got a book out at the moment. He toured with Rod Stewart. Um, you know, are you a nostalgic person? How do you look back on that period? Do you have, are you one of these people who, who thinks about sliding doors and if this had to happen or that had to happen, things might have turned out differently? Or do you think of it all as a blessing? Uh, you know, how do you look at the trajectory of the last 30 years? Um, uh, I guess, well, that's a, it's a pretty big question. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, humbled, humble and, uh, happy about what has happened, obviously, but I also worked hard for it, but, and yes, there was a lot of money in those days because there was a lot of money in the industry and, uh, which was fun. I'm I'm glad we were part of that. Um, since it's not like that anymore. I think for kids nowadays starting bands, hearing about all those crazy stories from the eighties and nineties and all the money and the limos and everything, it must be kind of kind of weird almost, I guess. But um to be honest, I mean I wouldn't change anything from what what's been going on since then? Uh, we've all personally and and for speaking for the band, we've always um, you know stayed true to what what we believed in, and um, there's never been any discussion or any thoughts on um, changing style because to you know to suit something or fit fit in somewhere. So I think that's like, um, I mean, as long as you stay, stay true to your own beliefs and, and do what you think is, is going to be the best thing, then, then that's all you can do. You, you never know about the future anyways, but you got to make sure. Yeah, yeah. It's like they say, it's not the goal, it's the, it's the journey. And as long as you enjoy the journey all the time, then, or most of the time, then that's all you can do. I was going to say, I always ask bands from Scandinavia, why why rock is uh, so solid there and and why uh, it's so mainstream where it's, it's it's gone away from the mainstream in so many other parts of the world and i get some really good answers i don't want to prompt you by by telling you other people's answers i'll just why why do you think you know rock is so strong there and it's such a, a global stronghold of, of rock music in scandinavia and particularly sweden who are exporting so many bands to the rest of the world right now um, well, first of all, I think that um, I always saw Sweden as a pop land, pop country, whereas uh, Finland, for instance, I see being a rock, more of a rock country. They, uh, 
they always had more attitude. And, and we had the melodies. I think Andy McCoy actually said this in some interview as well. And uh, the best thing is always if you can mix the two. And, and a lot of bands, like The Who, for instance, the perfect example, the mixture of great melodies and songs, but with with the attitude as well. But I think um, I think Swedish people are pretty like serious. That can also be a negative thing, but like as far as rehearsing and and working on stuff and you know it's it's not like you go have a drink before rehearsals uh as you would in england where you meet at the pub and then go to the rehearsal okay. which i kind of like more actually yeah yeah <laughs> well you see what i mean it's like i think people when you're serious about something and you do it often then you become good at it and and there is that mm. melody tradition from from well the 60s pop and what abba later took took forward so and as, especially nowadays i think there's a lot of uh, um like a and r a a u r i mean a u r band so there's a lot of melodic stuff it seems to be like a trend with that kind of music mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, yeah, you're right in that. Like, like especially the kids now. Like, like uh, that fella from Crazy Licks. You know, he uh, he said that he would never dream of having a drink before a show. You know, he's like so professional. He's like an athlete. You know what I mean? Whereas back in the day, yeah. people people performed drunk and high and everything like that. It's now that the kids are so much more serious, aren't they? You know. And the other thing that comes up is the darkness. A lot of these bands, young bands, tell me. The darkness had a massive, uh, and they, people go, I asked one guy and he goes, you mean the fact it gets dark early? I said, no, no, the actual band, the darkness, you know, that they had a big impact on uh, in Scandinavia for some reason and they inspired a, a new wave of, of bands, you know? Yeah, maybe they did. I don't, I don't know. I mean, if they were bigger here than in, in any other country, but uh, I've seen them live a couple of times. Great live band for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can ask you two, uh, one more thing. I, I read that you actually were in a Jamison's whiskey ad. Is that correct? In in the UK, is that right? Yeah, yeah I did. Tell me about that. In, Tell me about uh, that. When I was, when was this? During the Hanoi Rocks years, when I had dreads down to the waist. Uh, yeah, it was me. <laughs> how did you get? How did they spot you? Were, were you just? They spotted it was, your photo it's really on you. Jonas Ockerlund, the video guy, video director, is a friend of mine. Mm. And he mm. he actually called me and said, because we wanted to go, we, we've been talking about going, going for a beer, but it never happened because I would be out touring or he'd be working. So he, he phoned me and said, look, the only way we're going to go, be able to go have that beer is if we, if we work together. So would you mind doing a whiskey commercial? So I said, uh, okay, well, whiskey is it? Uh, he said, Jamison, no, okay, I'll call you back in five minutes. I called my friend who's a, who's a whiskey guy. I said, what about Jamison? Jam Jamison, as they say. Um, and he said, yeah, it's, it's great. It's like what they make Irish coffee from, as you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it's good, you know, you can, you can, <laughs> you can live with that. So, yeah, it was, it was fun. I went there for a couple of days to, to London and played fake, I uh, played harp, like fake you know but it, it's it's funny because there were some people who, who truly believed that i played harp and i mean that's like the most most difficult instrument apparently in the world to play um i wouldn't have that patience Tends for australia there. yeah i wish have you any plans to go there you wish yeah it's 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 far away <laughs> <laughs> you know, there would have to be like a serious plan to be able to do so, and and um, I know, I mean, just like financially to make it work. But we'd love mm -hmm. to. I'd be yeah. hunting for snakes and spiders of, every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, they'd be hunting for you. They'd be hunting for you. Uh, I'm not <laughs> of kangaroos. No, but I'd love to. I mean, it's a. Uh, <laughs> There's so many great, great bands coming from that. And everybody who, who's been there says it's it's wonderful. Whether it's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big country. I'd love to go.